What's up, wrestling fans? Uh, Richard Boudreau here. Welcome to a brand new edition of Kayfabe Kickout Audio for July 16, 2013 for kayfabekickout.com, putting the pro back in pro wrestling. On today's episode, I, ha I have a guest here who's no stranger to the world of professional wrestling. Uh, he is a former uh, WWE writer and creative team member, uh, screenwriter for the WWE film See No Evil, uh, which starred Kane, uh, author of the best-selling uh, book on the rich history of Lucha Libre wrestling, uh, Mondo Lucha Agogo, which is in stores now. Uh, Dan Madigan. Dan, how's it going? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, you're very welcome. So let's get right down to the uh, meat and potatoes of why you're on the show today. Um, there is a Kickstarter project that is currently on the go uh, for that is being headed by Japanese uh, legend uh, Ultimo Dragon, uh, can you just tell us what this project is all about and what your involvement is with this project? Sure, sure. Well, I'll give you a little backstory, if it's okay. Sure. Um, when I wrote Mondo Lucha Gogo, um, I was contacted by um, Kevin Baxter from the LA Times. I walked in one day into my house and there's an email from Kevin Baxter, and the only Kevin Baxter I knew was a sports writer, so he wanted to do um, a small little piece in the sports section about Lucha Libre, you know, and, um, he wanted to come to my house, talk for half an hour. I said, sure, why, why not? So he comes to my house a day later, and the half-hour conversation went to three hours of rambling. He ends up calling his editor saying, this has to be a front-page piece about the cultural thing. So the whole dynamic of the story changed. And they took him to a um, uh, an event in Pico Rivera down in California. It was an rest outside wrestling event. And I was, more or less, it was me and Kevin, the only you know, white guys there, and also Tom Kinney, the voice of SpongeBob, was a friend of mine. He's a huge, huge rest, uh, Lucha Libre fan, so he was in the crowd having a great time. And so Kevin wrote a really great article about um, Lucha Libre in California. He mentioned me in the book and the whole night. It was a really nice piece he put together. And two days later, um, my soon-to-be partner, Gary Lee Jackson, was just working in uh, Santa Monica, and he, he's working with a three-time Oscar winner and this, you know, very powerful person who knew Gary was a big wrestling fan and he tells Gary he says oh there's um, an article about Lucha Libre in the, on the um, on the, pay, on the paper so Gary runs out gets the paper and he sees my name in it and he's been seeing my name around and he starts you know evil and there's a writer of the team so he ends up calling me and he says uh, are you Dan Madigan working with Vince McMahon I said yes I am he says you Dan Madigan wrote Mondo Lucha Gogo yes I am did you write Gino Evil? I said, yes, guilty in all accounts. Mm -hmm. Guilty. He, he said, um, I represent a certain wrestler, and I'd like to talk about working with this, this wrestler. And at the time, I had left the business, and I was, I was sort of washing my hands. I had been approached before about other wrestlers. And I, to the back of my mind, the only wrestler I wanted to work with was Ultimo Dragon. Right. For various reasons. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I want to work with Ultimo Dragon. And Gary says, I represent Ultimo Dragon. Huh. And it was, one of those times, it was one of those times I go, okay, I must have thought it. He didn't say that or something. And he goes, no, I work, I'm the Little Dragon's manager. And I was like, I was sort of, for the first time, I lost the words. And I said, okay. So we ended up meeting the next night at a cigar place in L.A. And he comes in and he had all these ideas. We, had, we basically sat down, I started talking. And he has an amazing amount of work and ideas for all the Little Dragon, his career, whatnot. We just started talking in like... Um, Balling stuff, and I came up with some ideas. And he basically told me, to "Stop talking." You know, you know, you know the wrestling lingo. He says, "I'm calling my lawyer." He says, "We're now married." <laughs> and now my partner. So with that, he says, "We're married." So we ended up, you know, hooking up six years ago. And then we've had trials and tribulations of trying to bring Ultimo back into, you know, America the right way, but not during with a wrestling vehicle because you know we want to do something different. So we had different trials and whatnot. It falls along the way. We decided, you know. To walk away from the Hollywood, you know, way of doing things. We we had a lot of people with Hollywood people and whatnot, and no one quite saw what we wanted to do. The executives, the producers, um, they, they didn't quite understand what Ultimo was about, what Lucha Libre was about, what wrestling was about. So there's a stigma attached to everything. So we decided, how do we have control of what we want to do? And I said, listen, let's let's write a graphic novel. Let's do something different. Let's write a graphic novel uh, that has Ultimo Dragon in it. It has no wrestling in it. And Gary was like, what, that, what do you mean? I go, Let's, what does Ultimate Dragon have that's absolutely iconic? And that's his mask. Absolutely. The size of his career, it's been this iconic mask. Plus he has, you know, he's got hundreds of masks. He's got hundreds of these masks. And I said, well, let's, let's, let's say, where did the mask come from? What is this mask? 
mask come from? What does the mask mean? So I said, let's sit down and think about this. So when I came to the story, uh, it starts in the 12th century Japan. It's the, it's the start, the origin of this mask. And the mask itself will travel through time. It will go from Japan to Mexico to, you know, it's going to travel. And everyone that wears the mask will be affected by the mask. The mask will affect them vice versa. It's like a symbiotic relationship. Until eventually, you know, there's no wrestling in the story. So it's just the story of a mask and all the powers the mask has. So eventually it falls into Ultimo's hand along the way. But So that's how we broke everything down. It was like, let, let's tell a story. And as I was putting the story together, I realized there was just too much in there. So I broke it down from one graphic novel to five graphic novels. Right. So I spent the last, I spent the last year writing uh, 500 pages um, of this, this story, which it's arced from starting in Japan, going to Mexico, going to New Orleans in the post-World War II world, London in the swing 60s. And the last book of the series is a, like a post-apocalyptic world. It's much like, you know, Snake Plissken as his uh, ultimate dragon type of thing. Right. Uh, so that so that was that was the genesis. The idea. So we sat down. We realized the best way to bring this to life would be be Kickstarter. And so that's what we did. We launched that Kickstarter thing. We have a, we have a really great team. With Ultimo has been loving the stories. Um, Gary uh, Lee Jackson is Ultimo's manager. He's behind the project. Merch Burlow is one of our creative guys. So everything really worked well together. And then as we we're putting the team together, we realized you know we need an artist. We need an artist for the story and. We, you know, we looked around for people, and last year at the uh, Anime Expo, Gary was there, and I, was, I, I didn't attend that yet. He came upon a bunch of different artists, and he came upon one guy. He kept seeing this guy's work, Will Wood. Will Wood's work, Will Wood's work is amazing. And Gary kept texting me. He goes, "You know, Will Wood's work is it's fantastic." And Will has a famous piece, you know, that um, it's uh, Darth Vader at the Memorial Wall, and so you know, he's a well-known artist. And I said, I don't know if he, you know, he'd work with him. It's, it's kind of a long shot. So Gary contacts Will, and he emails me. He says, Hey, this is Gary Jackson. I'm working with Dan Madigan. We're doing the Ultimate Dragon. Would you like to, you know, talk and get involved? And um, he doesn't. He, there's no reply. So Gary reaches out again. Same thing. I'm Gary Jackson. I'm working with Dan Madigan. The Ultimate Dragon thing. Would you like to work with us? And then Will replies. He goes, This, this, this is a rip. This is a joke. <laughs> This is one of my friends, and, and, and he's and the guy goes, no, why? He goes, what do you mean? Do you know what Ultimate Dragon is? And this is the reply. This is the crazy. This is how crazy this world is. He goes, do I know what Ultimate Dragon is? He goes, bro, I was a pro wrestler for eight years. He goes, he's my idol. I came out of Dragon Gate USA. Wow. I was an Ultimate Dragon. Nice. And it was like, what are the, what are the chances of meeting an artist who knows wrestling, was a wrestler, came out of Dragon Gate USA? So it was, it was... The moment we met, the moment we met, it was that, that kinship, that, that 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 fraternity. You know, we just clicked. And Will's work has been absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. He's taken the story to a new level. Him and his partner Tyreen Carver have really taken the words, the story, and have created something phenomenal. So that's why we decided to go to Kickstarter. We wanted to to go to the fans and spread the word that way. So we, we thought that best thing for us, you know, no longer, no more studios, no more Hollywood, just go out there to where um, the story belongs. So that's, that's how we get uh, to that part right now. Wow, that's a, yeah, that's, that's a tremendous story. And um, so what you just said, that it was you and uh, Gary Jackson that, that, that came up with this idea, like, so I, I take it you, you've already approached Ultimo Dragon, like how was he, you know, how, did you, how did you like this idea? Oh, he loves the idea. He loves, he's been with, Gary's been his, um, for over, over eight years, for close to ten years, I think Gary's been Ultimo's manager, and he's really been, I mean, I've worked in Hollywood for a long time, and I've never seen a manager with this much loyalty, um, this much uh, go uh, for a client. He's gone above and beyond what I've ever seen done, so we've always kept Ultimo in the loop and stuff, and Ultimo is a very, very sharp guy, very, very smart. He's a, he's a businessman, he's an entrepreneur, and, um, we realized that he would get the story. So I, I broke it down very easily to him. I told him what's going on. He loved it. He loved the idea. So, you know, as I create the story, I keep everyone involved along the process. There's no surprises. And he's just been 100% behind the whole project the whole time. You know, and, that, and this is, and the graphic novel is just one, one thing that we want to do. You know, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg of what we, we're trying to do. Okay. And, so. 
so, so yeah, no, I was just gonna just gonna ask like what what other ideas do you have besides the graphic novel? Well, the idea for the graphic novel is, is to create this character, this universe, this world, and try to go off into like uh, animated features, feature films, video games, uh, a series of other graphic novels. It, it, it's just I me. Mean, if you think about wrestling, and at least in my point, if you think about wrestling and Lucha Libre, it's not a far leap from the wrestling mat to the cinematic screen or to the page of a comic book. You, you know, you're telling a story, you're telling everything right there, and you have the elements, whether it's in a wrestling match or a graphic novel, of a story. You've got protagonist, antagonist, drama, conflict, story arcs. So to us, our group, it's just a natural evolution. It, it makes sense. And that's why, I mean, if you look at El Santo and um, to Demon Mamascalas in the 50s and 60s and 70s, they made all their films. They would wrestle on a set. They'd need to be in a film uh, that night. You know, so it, it makes sense. Once you become in the wrestling world, you have that suspension of disbelief. And if you can believe two guys in the ring with mass wrestling, then you could believe anything after, in my opinion, believe anything afterwards with that. No. I mean, you know, no question. I mean, uh, you know, you hit the nail right on the head there that, you know, graphic novels are, they, they have intricate storylines, and especially, you know, especially with the, the Japanese culture, they're very big on anime, and they're very big on the graphic novel scene, so this is, you know, I think, um, I think, you know, I, I think in my own, my own opinion that, you know, fans of the Ultimo Dragon, like, and fans of uh, Lucha Libre, I think they'll, they'll embrace this, uh, they'll embrace this project. That's why, and the thing for us is, we know it's a good project. We know that people like it. Just in, in anything, it's spreading the word. It's getting the. That's why I appreciate you putting me on now. It's just it's getting the word out there to people. It's very hard sometimes to just you know to email or blast people or Facebook to really get the word out there. Because once we explain the idea, people dig the idea. They they, they dig the concept and stuff. But you're right, the Japanese culture. Because I mean, I just came to the Anime Expo uh, two weeks ago, a week ago, and the people love it. I mean, they dress up, it's called the cosplay, they dress up, because in a place like the Anime Expo, a place where it's like, where it's like you know, um, anime and magna, and no one, there's no one judging you. There's no one to critique you or criticize you, and it's a nice way to escape and stuff. So, you know, I was walking around the hall and everyone's in costume, and I thought it was amazing that people were just, you know, becoming, part of, they were submerging themselves in this world. And I think that's a great, I think that's a great, great thing, especially for what we want to do, because wrestling, I think wrestling fans, I think anime fans, I think movie fans, uh, we all share the same thing. It's a, it's a passion. It's a passion for the product. And without passion, there's, um, there's, there's nothing there. No, that's that's absolutely right. And that was going to be that was going to be my my next question because as as you know, working in the professional uh, wrestling industry as long as you did, like there are the the cynics and the and the the marks that would wonder, well, why does a wrestler like Ultimate Dragon? You know why does he have to do a Kickstarter project? You know why doesn't he? You know why doesn't he have the money to you know to to the front for this for this project himself? Well, that's a good. I mean, because the the idea is this: we we wanted to make this project with Ultimo Dragon, but separate, not to you know we wanted to make sure that it could survive on its own, that the project itself could survive on its own, that the concept could survive on its own, and you know we we don't want to tap its resources. There's other things we want to use down the road. You know. A lot of sponsors, a lot of resources. We want to want to like, play our cards the right way and stuff. I mean, you know, he can drop a bunch of money into this. But we wanted ourselves, the team, to create this project and see if it can live on its own. If that makes sense and stuff. And plus, you know, there's, there's a lot of people he knows. We want to wait the right time. We don't want it to come out and use all resources the first time out. If that made sense, that's a good question. We thought about that ourselves quite a bit. You know, should we go right to the golden cat, golden cow, and you know, we debated that for a while. Ultimately, I think bottom line is when the fans partake, they become part of it. They, you know, when, I think when the fans become part of it, um, it's they, they empathize with them more. It's, it's their thing. It's not more. Not really Ultimo's thing now. It's the fans thing as well, which I think is the most important thing to us. That's right. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, and I think, I think uh, for the most part, for most of these Kickstarter uh, campaigns that people in professional wrestling, uh, whether they're you know, wrestling now, or they have wrestled. Uh, I think, you know, the social, the social, the social aspects of you know Kickstarter. I think is what draws fans to donate to these campaigns. Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, um, it's you know, if, if you talk about the 
social media and the social networks, and, and, and I may be wrong, but I think the first social networks really, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, were the wrestling fans. If you think back, was it 20 years ago, maybe more, we were tape traders. Mm-hmm. And we, and the only way you can really get to see matches from outside your region and territory, you would, you would trade tapes with fans from around the world. And so we, we had this sort of underground network of people, you know, from one part of the country, sending their tapes to someone else, and vice versa, and you switch tapes, you, you, you would, you'd borrow with tapes, and you'd, you'd, you know, swap tapes, and that was, and that was the first time I really noticed that a group of people with the same interest were doing something on a social level. It was, even though it was just VHS tapes and trading, but, you know, that was, to me, was the first social network of, of, a, of interaction between fans. No, and it just made sense, I mean, it just made sense, I mean, some of the first matches I saw, Japanese matches, were badly duped and, you know, triple duped tapes, you know, you can imagine what that's like, mm-hmm. but it's the only time we'd see those. And so, I, that that mindset, that passion carried over the Kickstarter theology. It's like, wrestling fans are passionate fans, they're smart fans, they're not marks, they're, they love the prop. If you give them a good product, we'll back you on that. That was, that all ideology behind that too, so, I mean, no matter what happens to the project, we wanted to know that it was the, it's for the fans, because basically, I'm the biggest fan around, me and Gary, would in, in Baltimore, will say, same thing. He's a fan as well. You know, that's that's why we, we, we're going this route. No, I mean, you know, you're you're. I think you know, you're one hundred percent right that the tape trading and the, the social aspects, and yeah, you're right. Twenty twenty five years ago, before Twitter and Facebook and before uh, the internet, and uh, it was the only way uh, fans could uh, interact with each other. So no, I think this is a, I think this is a tremendous way to get uh, you know the word out about Ultimo Dragon. Uh, you can share it uh, now. You can share it through Twitter and Facebook. And uh, so, yeah. so the campaign is is going well so far. So you need to raise thirty five thousand dollars in the next forty seven days. Yes, that's that, that's it. We want to raise you know um, thirty five thousand in the next forty seven days. And it, it's this give and take. This you know, this hills to go. But we're trying to reach out to many people as possible. And the great thing about this is too, with the Kickstarter, there's all different increments that people can they can uh, donate. You know, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, three hundred dollars. And at every level, we have something that we have premiums that we uh, we give away, and not just give away, but you know, you become part of the team. We want people to believe they're part of the whole collective. So when we're doing this, we thought the fans are major, are the major portion of this. So what can we offer the fans that they haven't seen before? And this is something that you know we haven't seen before. We wanted to really just um, do something special, you know. And I think if you look at some of the stuff we have, it's, I think it's really cool. Some of the stuff we're offering and stuff. And, it's um, it's an amazing. I think it's an amazing thing. It is an amazing thing. I, I checked out the page earlier, and uh, there's and you're right. There, you know, for fans that want to donate, just go to Kickstarter uh, Kickstarter dot com and type up uh, Ultimo Dragon graphic novel. It'll be the first thing that comes up. And there's multiple yeah. do, both multiple donation levels, and you can get uh, autographed action figures. You can get autographed headshots, and there's a you know a multitude of different options. So. Uh, you know, I think this is a you know, I think this is a fantastic project. So, what? Why thirty five thousand dollars? Like, was it uh, a number that you and Gary had decided on, or was it was there, was there other factors well, that were considered? Well, we went back and forth about this. We thought maybe should we do lower, should we higher? And we were trying to figure what's what's the number that could a get reasonably funded, but more importantly, what could pay for you know printing and uh, publishing costs because the whole thing comes down to printing and publishing costs. I mean. Uh, I already, I've already written everything. Will we have to pay Will to take the time to write I me mean, to draw this because it's a pretty, it's a pretty intense story. It's mm-hmm. pretty, you know, visually intense story. So it's going to take a while for to do that. And as the writer, you always, you know, the writer always takes a few bumps here and there. You always going to realize you may not get everything coming to you. But we figured thirty-five would be good enough to publishing costs, uh, cover our expenses, and then what we want to do also is once the, once the, the graphic novel is done. Sending hard copies, we could also sell copies digitally on our websites. Nice. And, and we can also, also keep the storylines going. I think the great idea, too, is with our website is have original content. Just, even though you have a graphic novel, once a month we'd have a page or two of another original story coming just for the fans. So now you've got multiple areas of uh, venues are telling the story. You know, so that was, that was, that was the, the ideology behind that. 35, we thought, we hope 35 was a, was a reachable, reachable goal. I, no, I, I think it is. I think uh, you know, thirty-five thousand. It like when I first saw it, it, it looked like it looks like a 
uh, a reasonable amount. And because you see some, not not just you know professional wrestling campaigns, but you see some campaigns where people are asking for one hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you have to wonder like you know you know what the hell is all this money going into? And but thirty five thousand seems like a reasonable number, you know, to get to get these to get these graphic novels off the ground. So. Uh, yeah. Fluctuating between 25 and 35, we got 35 is the one way to go. Two is, pays too much money, then sometimes that's a problem. We'll be that out too. We want to work workable for us that we could we could handle uh, all the rest of the board. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, yep. Hello? Yep. Okay. Oh, good, good. So, but that's a good question. I mean, that. That was, that was, trust me, there was a lot of debate over that. That was a lot of debate over that, 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 that number, a lot of debate. Yeah, I can I, I can only imagine. But, you know, like I said, 35000 seems like a, a more than reasonable number. And uh, I'm sure in the next 47 days you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to reach the goal. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing these, uh, you know, graphic novels uh, getting off the ground because I'm a, I'm a big comic book fan. I'm a big graphic novel fan. And, uh, you know, from what – You've told me and the listeners it sounds like a like a fantastic storyline, and uh, and especially you know the storyline centers around his masks. And you know from writing Mondo Lucha Gogo, I'm a fan of Lucha Libre that the mask is the most important aspect of a Lucha Libre wrestler. So yeah, that's it's the, the mask is it's a, it's a second skin, it's his soul. I mean, it basically determines who he is a lot. And so that, we took a lot of um, time creating that the concept of the mask and how the mask affects other people, too. Uh, because some people wearing a mask will always get the same results, if you think about it. So it, there's a lot of consequences, too. Like, it's, if you put the mask on, and the, the idea behind the story is, if you put the mask on, it may not be everything you wanted. You know, there comes a lot of responsibility wearing the mask. It's like, basically, the idea is that Batman's mask can travel through history. You know, what happens if that call had gone through a flow of five, six, seven centuries? What happens to the people that wear the mask? Mm-hmm. Some, sometimes not everything every comes out the way you want it to come out. So that's the idea of the story. It's the same thing with wrestling. It's the same thing. Don't give your, you know, your, your hero, your protagonist, everything he wants. Because there's no reason for a journey. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Just just, just like you mentioned that the storyline is graphic novel, uh, much like storylines of professional wrestling, there, there has to be... There's not not much of that in 2013, but I think a good storyline, whether it's graphic novels or whether it's professional wrestling, has to have a a, a start, a middle, uh, you know, a middle, an arc as they call it, and, and an ending. So, oh, absolutely. And the thing about I think the thing with our story is we have a great start, we have a great goal, and um, sometimes the endings sometimes a little open ended. Sometimes I think the open ended because that way it leaves. And the story is room to breathe sometimes. You know, sometimes it's, it's like a great match. Sometimes you don't, a great wrestling card, you don't give everything you want right away. You let it build and you think about the next time. You, know, you don't give everything what they want. Just, you know, a little here, a little there. That's what we're, that's the idea behind it. You know, if we, we, if we wrapped it all up in five books, there'd be nothing but the sixth book or the seventh book. So that's the ideology behind that. Excellent. Yeah, no, I mean, as I said, this sounds like a, sounds like a fantastic, um, Fantastic journey, fantastic campaign, and as I as I said, uh, fans, you can go to Kickstarter.com and uh, just type up Ultimo Dragon uh, graphic novel, and you can read up on the entire project and uh, you know Dan's involvement as a writer, and just the you know uh, you know as I said, I think it's going to be a fantastic uh, fantastic uh, graphic novel series. I'm you know really looking forward to it, and you know like I said, I'm sure in the next forty seven days. You know, yeah, I'm sure in the next 47 days, people are gonna they're gonna open up their wallets and you know donate to this uh, fantastic cause. So, if I could switch gears here and talk about, uh, yeah, getting on uh, staying on the subject about Lucha Libre, um, I read your book, uh, absolutely fantastic book. Um, as, you know, as I said, uh, fans, it's called Mondo Lucha Agogo: The Entire History of Lucha Libre. Um, what was it like for you to write a book which that was so extensive in terms of, of Lucha Libre? Um, it was funny because I was always a, a, a Lucha Libre fan before I, I was approached by this. I mean, like anyone else, I was, you know, I watched the matches I could, through, once again, through tape trading, you know, the matches. But I also started watching um, the Santo films as a kid when they came to America. I was watching all these uh, Santo horror movies and stuff. So I had, you know, my knowledge of Mexican wrestling was always intertwined with cinema and horror movies and stuff. 
stuff. So I, I thought I had I thought I had a pretty good idea what was behind everything. And I was approached by um, Harper Collins, uh, a friend of mine. Uh, Mark Gerald was in, you know, was working for an imprint of them over there at uh, Rail Books. He's a he's a book agent, and they wanted to do a book about Butcher Libre. And I don't think anyone know knew what Butcher Libre was over there. Harper Collins. So he um they contacted me, and I got on the phone with the, the guys over there, and um they were asking me questions like, do you know do you know Latino Heat? And I said, well, Eddie Guerrero. Hmm. Yeah, he's a good friend of mine. And they started asking questions, and they go, really? And I said, yes, we're asking questions. So basically, they said, would you like to write a book about Lucha Libre? And my response was, um, well, do you want to pay me? <laughs> and they said, well, sure. So that was, that, that, that's basically as a writer. That's the first thing you could ask. Absolutely. And they yeah. said, sure. So I, I, so I started um, I started doing some research, but at the time I was working for Vince, the WWE, and so I told Vince, I said, um, about this project, and I couldn't really do it and why I was there because um, they said conflict, conflict of interest. Okay. I said, all, all right. So I waited. Yeah, which, you, I, you know, to be honest, I didn't see a conflict of interest, but, you know, Vince is signing my paycheck, so. That's right. It's a conflict of interest. But I never really, I never really contacted anyone. I never really bothered anyone while I was there because I respect for that. But once I left the business, I was always in contact with people. And I remember I had a really great conversation when I was Chavo Guerrero, a senior, and we were talking about, about the business. This is WrestleMania 20, the night before WrestleMania 20, Saturday night, I'm in a bar with Chavo. And for three hours, he was telling me about his family's history and the business. And I just sat there, and I mean, I didn't say a word for once. I said, I took everything in, I was blown away. Hmm. And so I used a lot of that as um, the nucleus of the book. And then once I got out of uh, wrestling, I was in contact with Eddie Guerrero, and he was opening up doors for me. And unfortunately, you know, Eddie, um, Eddie passed away. Yes. And yeah. that was just a, that was a major um, blow. Um, I remember that day, Michael Cole called me at like seven o'clock in the morning. It was a major blow. So I didn't feel right going down those avenues that Eddie had opened up for me. I just didn't feel right. So I said, but he opened up enough doors to me. I started asking other people, and I would go to Mexico, and everyone, everyone I asked was just like totally behind the project. They opened up. It was so so kind. Opened up more doors. And a lot of things, like I was like the um, the gringo coming into this, you know, into this project. So they were very, very uh, forthright. And I was lucky. I had some really nice people helping stuff. You know, I had Dr. Rudge from Chipper. Uh, I was a friend of mine. He was writing some stuff for the book. Uh, Keith Rainville, who used to publish The Parts Unknown. He contributed some great stuff. Um, I friend, you know, Rudge had wrote a part about Paul Heyman. So I had a lot of stuff about the book. I had a lot, a lot of information. And the book took me... About I'd say a year, um, and it just became a labor of love. And when I first when my first draft was um, ninety thousand words. Wow! And Harper Collins, and Harper Collins, I got a conference call. And they were freaked out. They go, "You never had any book, any subject approach like this." And so we have to knock off thirty thousand words. This is too much. I had two, I basically had two books there. And the other thing is, I sent them five thousand images. So I had um, literally my, my photographer, Ed McGinty, and I, Eddie, Eddie's a good friend of mine. He was the main photographer. I had an amazing collection of um, posters from Hollywood Book and Poster in Hollywood. I had stills, posters, lobby cards. So there was just so much information that, you know, we had almost overkill. And the hardest process was limiting the photographs and then taking the 30,000 words out and making the story coherent again. But once it was done, you know, I was really... Um, I was really pleased with what they did. I think they did a great job. And as you know, the, the book is an international success, which means there's no money. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's critical success, which means there's no money, because I got a royalty check for like 17 cents once. So I, you know, but everyone loves the book, but, but so that's how it is as a writer sometimes, you know. But it was a, it was a, it was a process worth doing. And I, would, I would do it again if I had the chance. Wow, that's, a, that's, a, that's tremendous. And uh, so you said the book took you about a year. Now, it, is that... A long time for the average writer to write a book, or is that a relatively short time? Well, see, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I'm the average writer. I don't think I've had the average writer's career. Okay. Um, I've, you know, every writer's sort of different. I've bounced around from Hollywood doing screenplays to wrestling to books, graphic novels. So, you know, I don't know how the people do it. I just knew that when I had the chance to be wrestling, I just went um, contractually. They said, yeah, we need to be here. So I, I used the year fairly well. I, I did a lot, a lot of research. I went to Mexico a couple of times, and in the meantime, as I was doing this book, I was creating a documentary with some people about Lucha Libre. It was based on my book, which is actually, it's just like Saturday down in downtown 
place called Viva Lucha Libre, and it's based upon the Mondo book. It's produced by uh, Larry Dosimo and uh, Brad Nemus, who just got accepted to another film festival yesterday. So, you know, the book has led to, you know, uh, documentaries. It's led to my partnership with Gary, which is a graphic novel. There's another documentary called Tales of Masked Men by uh, Carlos Avila, and he used the book quite a bit also in that documentary. So it's, it's been a nice calling card. You know, the time I put into the book was a nice calling card. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, I read the book and I thought it was absolutely, uh, thought it was just, just a tremendous book. Not just, not just on the, you know, for those of, for wrestling fans that haven't read this book, I strongly suggest run out and get it. And, uh, there were a lot of things in this book that I did not know. I mean, I consider myself somewhat, you know, a pretty knowledgeable wrestling fan, but the, when you had talked about Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant, as the machines, I had no idea about that whatsoever. And it's, I was just totally, I cannot picture guys like Hogan and Andre in Lucha Libre masks. Oh, well, it, the, the great thing about the mask is to, even though, take Andre especially, it doesn't matter what mask but Andre, and you know it's Andre the Giant. I mean, it's, just, it's Andre the Giant. That's I mean, right. It doesn't matter if you put him in, you know, he's all of the Andre, but the fact is he puts the mask on, and it sort of gives him leeway to be something he can be or, or pretend to be, which is nice. The mask is a great way of sort of liberating the, the wrestler from the persona, his other persona, which is nice. You know, and the, the mask sort of hides who you are, but in, in another way, it brings up who you really are, which is nice because the eyes of society are not, not judging you. You can be what you want to be. And I think um, a lot of stuff, I mean, I think Roger did a great job. I think he wrote that section on that about Andre and the uh, Hulk Hogan being machines. And then it's just, it's just a great way of like um, liberating yourself. When you hide your face, you liberate yourself. Yeah, no, 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 no question. And, and uh, you know, there's other, other sections of the book and you mentioned like the killer bees and how, and I think, I know, I think you hit the, the nail right on the head that during the 1980s, the WWF, you know, WWF, didn't seem like it had a whole lot of respect for the Lucha Libre culture. You know, you had the killer bees and that was basically the extent of mass wrestlers. I mean, throughout the history of the WWF, you had guys like Mel Mascaris, and, but that was pretty much yeah. it. That, that was it. I mean, Mel, Mel, Mel would come in, he was like, you know, the ambassador from, you know, remember, Mel would come up probably, he probably worked, you know, uh, at Mike LaBelle's place in, in, in LA, the Olympic, and he'd work his way through the country, and he'd, he'd look at it, and he would probably finish up with Vince, he'd do the tour and stuff, but, you know, wrestling, American wrestling was all regional, it was all broken up different regions and stuff, everyone had their own region, for the most part, you know, the money was on your champion, you know, like you had Nick Barkwinkle, you had Hogan, you know, all the guys from champs, so, you know, you didn't want to hide the face at that point, because American wrestling is so different from Mexican wrestling, you That's know, right. yeah. where, um, the, the very, one of the very first um, heated discussions I had with Vince, arguments, was about Ultimo Dragon, and about mass wrestling, and this is the time where I was working with Vince, and Ultimo was, was Going to leave. His contract was up. He was going to leave, and I basically, I basically pegged Vince and said, "No, you can't leave. You know, he's the best worker. And he's the best guy in the car. He's an amazing talent. Um, and if he leaves, we're going to lose a great opportunity." And he basically, we had Ray Mysterio, who was another great worker, but Ray was injured. And Vince basically said to me, "Well, we have one guy with a mask on, huh. on the roster, Jeez. and he, anymore will confuse the fans." Oh my God! I said, "Vince." There's 10,000 guys in Texas wearing masks. No one's confused. <laughs> if anything, it's... Yeah, but, and, but, you know, but Vince sees things his way, and, and you can't you can't fault success, you know? Vince, Vince is, a, you know, Vince has built an empire doing things his way. And so I realized, you know, um, I remember Paul Heyman looking at me at the table, don't, you're not going to win this battle. I realized, and I, I told Vince, I told him, you know, bring him super crazy, you know, who would die? I had all these guys to bring in who worked with Ultimo before, who were great workers, a cruiserweight division, and it didn't really go anywhere. And I think that mindset has always been that the WWE, is, they do things their way. And so it's very hard to bring in a style of wrestling that most guys can't wrestle, and a concept that most guys don't understand. You know, so I think I think in the 80s, the 80s was such an experimental way, too. It was so, wrestling had just broken to the national level, and you know, things were just hitting, so they were throwing everything uh, at one point, throwing everything at, at, at the board, and the only real mass wrestlers were the conquistadors, and they became, like, jobbers. Right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Which is kind of a... Because if you think about it, think about the career you can have as a really, as a, as a you know, and, they, and, and 
Lucha Libre, the mass wrestler, all wrestlers called Luchadors, of course, but the mass wrestlers called the Mascarado. And think about the career that a Mascarado could have, like no masters in the WWE. I mean, think about it. I mean, you could have an amazing career. Think about the merchandise and the career, the storylines that, that are so rich that Mexico has embraced for years. Yeah. That's, that's you know, you know those so are... Absolutely was, and uh, yeah, then you know I started watching wrestling around maybe 1985, and I did like aside from the Killer Bees, like I and I vaguely remember the Conquistadors, and, and then when the and then when we got into the 1990s, like the only <laughs> mass wrestlers seemed to to pick up a little more, uh, especially in WCW. I mean, you can say what you want about yeah. uh, about Eric Bischoff, but I mean, you know, he ba- I mean he basically got the idea from Paul Heyman to bring in. Well, uh, Paul, yeah. Exactly. Pa- Paulie brought the boys in, and uh, you got to give them the nod that they realized, okay, that there's another fan base out there. you got to realize, too, that it's about, you know, 40 million Hispanics in America, and the, and the, the two things they love, uh, you know, they love telenovas, uh, soccer, and lucha libre, mm-hmm. you know, and so this is, this, is what this, and this is when I was doing the book, I did the research, and they're very they're loyal fans, so it's very smart to sort of go to that fan base, the demographic, and sort of reward them. And I thought the one thing that didn't work was when, when I left the business, Vince brought in, it was super crazy, and Hoover died, and psychosis, and he brought these guys in. And instead of wearing the mask and, and the personas, they took everything off, and they, they put them in, you know, on, in jumpsuits, and they put them on John Deere tractors, and they called them the Mexicals. And I was like, wow, what, what a way to, to destroy the British gap of culture, destroying you had a great chance, and I thought to bring the luchadors over, create an exciting, exciting, cruiserweight division and it just sort of like you know dropped dropped by the wayside for a gimmick that I thought wasn't like a very good gimmick no that was a um, that, no that was a that was a terrible working, yeah it was kind of a but you know once again I'm not working there so I mean so I guess they were right I was wrong you know well I mean you know uh, you know as you said I mean the, you know the WWE they they are where they are because of Vince and his vision but I mean you know Vince is you know Vince has made some really ridiculous choices yeah. in, in his in his forty years as you know as you know head of the WWE or whatever. So I mean, yeah, the Mexicals Mexicals is ridiculous, and and toward the yeah. toward the de- the decline of WCW, like they took they took Rey Mysterio's mask off, which I thought was a mistake, and um, that, that was that was a travesty. It was. I mean, I thought that I thought that really was a really slap to the face of the business to Ray, and but you know that's what. Unfortunately, that things happen sometimes. And here's the funny thing, right? I think this is about wrestler fans that have sometimes short attention spans but long memories, if that makes sense. You know, they'll, 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 they'll forgive a gimmick and forget about it for a while, but in the long run, they'll remember what happened, they'll remember what happened and stuff. And they forget, you know, I think, no fault but a race, it's just, I think it was a bad, it was a bad thing to do. And for what was the payoff? There was no payoff. Yeah, no. It was, you know? the needle, the needle, ba- uh, yeah, the needle barely moved on, uh, you know, when, in that time in WCW, well, I mean, the ratings were in the toilet, and you know, it was the it was the Vince Russo regime, and uh, just some ridiculous ridiculous things that you know ultimately le- ultimately led to the company's demise. But that didn't even uh, move the needle, and I you know I thought it was a slap in the face to Ray as well. So exactly, I mean, you're right; it didn't move the needle. There was nothing nothing was gained from it. Nothing was gained from it. So that's the funny thing when, when you're working in wrestling. What's you know what's the long term goal when you come up with a storyline and arc and angle? What what's the payoff? Because you always got to think of the future. You can't think of the past. You got to think of the now and the future. And I think sometimes with Vince, um, he's trying to. And I respect Vince immensely, immensely. Um, but he's trying to sometimes get lightning to strike in the bottle twice. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And sometimes things don't have a chance to breathe. Sometimes you just need things a chance to breathe. I think once you give, you know, uh, an angle, I mean, remember when, when Austin said that 316, that took a while for that to happen, to go, once that, once that really clicked, that was amazing. Look what Paul Heyman did with Sabu and Taz. Mm-hmm. He kept them away for a, a, a year and a half. I mean, that's, a, that's unheard of. That's unheard of. And once these guys went at it, it the house came down. So I, I think sometimes this, you know, this um, an unseen necessity to push things a lot. Yeah, no, that's right, you know. Which, I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous to create. I think it's dangerous because when you rush things, sometimes the talent can't come. You know, they, they can't mature the way you want them to mature. Sometimes. Yeah, that's right. 
No, you're, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're absolutely right on that. I mean, uh, you know, storylines do need a chance to, uh, the chance to evolve. And it seems like, seems like in 2013, like, you know, I remember back in the nineties during the attitude era and even before the attitude era, uh, you know, when, when Bret Hart was WWF champion. And then when you had, you know, the NWA and WCW, it seemed like they would have storylines mapped out for months, but it seems like nowadays in 2013, they do things week to week. Oh, absolutely. Oh, week to week sometimes it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a sense of urgency sometimes. And you just got to sit back and let things just, just get itself out naturally. You know, it's the only way, it's the only way sometimes that anyone can grow, wrestling can grow, and I, and I think the fans grow with it sometimes too. Yeah, no, it's, uh, <laughs> you're, you know, you're absolutely right on that one. Um, so during your time with the WWE, you were, you were a writer for both Raw and and SmackDown. What, what was it? What was it like working for uh, you know a man like Vince McMahon? Because you know I've I've heard in other interviews of former other former WWE writers, some have commented that Vince is a very intimidating individual. That he's a man that who gets what he wants, and it's hard to say no to a guy like Vince. What was what was Vince? Um, what was it like working with Vince in, from your experiences? Well, here's, here's the funny thing. When, when I came into the company, I was interviewed. Uh, by Stephanie in Los Angeles. And then I met with her, and then after the interview, uh, they wanted to hire me. My manager at the time was contacted by uh, WW Films. They had just opened up WW Films in, in LA. And they were, they were looking for um, you know, writers to do stories and whatnot, so they sent one of my scripts. They really liked my scripts, so I went down to meet the, um, the head of the studio. And so we're talking back and forth, and what happens, and ironically, is Stephanie hired me to work for the TV show, Vince's people hired me to write their first movie, Seen No Evil. So when I went to Stanford, Connecticut, I was the golden boy. I was the guy that wow, and, and, and the funny thing is, no one knew I was the same guy. So I was the golden boy by four, well, for five minutes. After five minutes, then it started to tarnish really quickly. <laughs> but so when Vince, when Vince met me first, I was first the writer of his movie. And then I was the writer of the show. So I sort of like um, a dual role there. And, um, you know, it's going to. Vince is the head of a major, major corporation. You know, he heaviest of other words, the crown. I mean, there's a lot of decisions made, and sometimes you're not going to get it 100%. You just can't. But Vince, you know, Vince every day, he makes hundreds of decisions every day. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes it's not all going to be decisions you think are the right ones, but, you know, look at, you can't argue with the success he's had. You know, and, and like I said, it's his bottom line. He signed my check. It was his company. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the things I fight for, I, I fight for a lot of my things. I fight, I get some real heated arguments. But today, it's Vince told me choose the battle, you know, choose the hill to die on. So sometimes I'd fight for certain angles, and then other times I would sort of give up on certain angles. And you know, um, I just want to make the product better. I wanted to make the fans enjoy themselves, and I thought that was it. But and I can say this about this, you know, if you take all his money away, and he's got a lot of money. Vince loves the business. He loves the fans. That's. I mean, I've seen the guy talk. I mean, this is what he, it's all about. Him. It's the business. So no, it's not about making the money for Vince. It's about putting on the best show he can. And he's doing for forty years. So you're going to have a couple of slips here and there. I don't know forty years. It's just the way it happens. You know, we all become get fuck after a while. Hmm. It's interesting that you, you you would comment that on how Vince loves the business because, uh, it's you know it's. A common thing that most wrestling fans, and I guess, and some people in the industry have commented that if Vince could get away with it, that he would get rid of the wrestling ring and just have nothing but storylines. Like, do you, do you agree with that? Do you think that that's Vince's ultimate well, goal? I, I think I think the one the one thing that really hasn't evolved. I mean, every part of entertainment has evolved. If you look at movies, if you look at like you know just you know the way it affects it, evolved, everything's evolved a certain way except wrestling. Wrestling is the slowest thing to evolve. It used to be that you'd watch a wrestling show to be detained, okay? Now you're watching entertainment with some wrestling in it. Mm-hmm. So, it's sort of, it, it, in a way, you're right. It's almost like, you know, the, um, the the wrestling ring has become the stage. And and one time, I mean, I remember a friend of mine, we were watching Raw, he goes, when are they going to wrestle? <laughs> I mean, sometimes you, you have an opening segment, you've got 21 minutes, and you're doing promos. It's like, okay, I mean, let's just, eventually it's a match coming in somewhere. I think the problem is sometimes, too, that sometimes there may not be the talent, some of the talent's hurt, or, you know, you only don't have, you have only so many guys to work with sometimes. I mean, I mean, it's, you need the story. 
storylines, you need the wrestling, you need both. I don't think one should overshadow the other. But at the end of the day, everything's resolved in the ring. All the conflict is resolved in the ring. And you got to get them in the ring. So, I mean, I'm all for a great storyline. I mean, I'm a sucker for a great storyline. But you got to, at one point, get in the ring. Mm-hmm. You know? And I think that's what the fans want to be. If you think of what these guys do, they do the, they do the best in the world what they do. They're entertainers, they're athletes, they're acrobats, they're performers. Once they step between the ropes, I mean, that's it. They put on a show. And they're putting a show through physicality. And you just got to get up there quicker sometimes, I think. So you don't, so like you, you, so obviously you don't agree with, with what most people say about Vince then, that he wants to get rid of the, the wrestling ring. That's just, you know, that's No, just, I, 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 I think, no, I, I think, I don't think he wants, no, you realize that that's where it's, but I, I think he's trying to broaden, Vince once told me he wanted to take wrestling to a new level, almost an operatic level, and I could see that. But was the, the, here's the thing though, was wrestling. We're still the bottom line. It's still wrestling, mm-hmm. so you can't go that far from it. But you know, but I think the storylines that have gone from, from the, if you look at the eighties, they, they were basically feuds. It wasn't until the nineties the storylines became really involved and, and started to come down, like the, you know, to become evolved storylines. And I hopefully think it's going back, you know, because you know they've created a world of characters that are so bizarre that you need storylines. Undertaker, Kane. I mean, these guys. Where do they come from? What do they do? I mean. You need to have something just besides the wrestling, but you gotta you gotta weigh it evenly. Okay, how much story, how much wrestling? But I think I, I I know I've seen Vince, I've seen the look in his eyes. He loves the business, he loves the fans, and I can't I can't sit there and, and, and say that's not true. You know, I mean he's doing the best thing he can do to put the best story out. There's a lot of pressure there on him. Um, I consider it bad mouth Vince and bad mouth the business, but that that wouldn't be true. And so I think he's just trying, you know, the best way he can, what he has at his disposal, to get the best product possible. And I don't. I mean, I work. Those guys work their ass off. They work. The guys in the ring. The guys behind. I mean, the writing staff. I mean, my buddy Ed Kosky, he's been in the years. He works his ass off. Michael Cole works his ass off. All those guys get body and soul, and they wouldn't do that if it was if it wasn't um, a love for the, for the business. That's right. Uh, you make a good point, and I mean, you know, as you said, Vince has been doing this for close to fifty years, and uh, he's, you know, obviously he's doing something right, and obviously he, you know, he brought the WWE to the next the next level, and you know, during the the nineteen eighties, like during you know when Hulk Hogan exploded, you know, Vince ran with that, and he just he turned this small uh, regional promotion into a world, and it literally is a worldwide phenomenon. So. Uh, you know, I think I, I think I can agree yeah. with you that uh, that Vince. You know, I I look at Vince, and you know, he's a very enigmatic character. He's a very, you know, and he seems like you know, you're right. You just look in his eyes, and you see, you know, the passion that he has for professional wrestling. Yeah, it, it's 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 a love that um, every Monday morning we'd be we'd be on his, his private jet flying out to where we're going, and Vince would say, "In all candy, this, this is the greatest job in the world." I and mean, he he just couldn't wait for Monday morning. Yeah, do a show, you know. So there's, you know, there's. Uh, he really loves doing what he does, and most of most of the time he does it well, you know. Or, or he tries to give the best shot. Um, it's like it's like Vince is a way. There's a lot like I think Roger Corman in the film industry. Roger Corman would make for years, make hundreds of movies and create characters and stories, and you know, some hit and some miss. And, and from Corman, you have look at all the people that come out of Corman. You have like guys like Martin Scorsese. Spielberg and, and Ron Howard, all these great directors coming out of the Coleman factors. The same with Vince. Vince is crazy, like Stone Cold, The Rock, Hulk Hogan, to some extent. He's taken talent to a new level. So without Vince, there wouldn't be. I mean, the biggest star in Hollywood is it's got to be Dwayne Johnson. If you think about it, mm-hmm. he's in everything, and he and he, he came out of uh, you know Vince Studios, if you want to say say it like that. So there's something. And the thing about wrestling is, it's, it's everyone has a wrestling story. You know, we've all been wrestling fans. There's, there's, we loved it, but we didn't love it. But it's always been part of it's part of the culture, and it sort of unites us to who we are. That's right. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you're you're uh, you're 100 right about that. I mean, as as much as wrestling fans complain, they continue to watch the product. And you know, there was a there was a period where I stopped watching wrestling, probably maybe between 2007, maybe 2010. But I came back in 2011, and I've been watching it. Yes watching it since i mean we all need a break from whatever it is like whatever our hobbies are like for a little while but we always you know and like you said fans always come back they come back and watch the product and 
And I mean, it's it's you know it's why Vince is you know the success that he is. And you would now you would mention that you would mention that you went out written several storylines. Obviously, as a writer for Raw and SmackDown, the one storyline that I'd like to talk about is the the Kane uh, Snitsky Lita pregnancy storyline. Now, it's you know for the most part, fans uh, didn't seem like they took too well to that to that storyline. In would you would you have write, write, uh, written it differently, like if you were working for the WWE in 2013? Like, uh, would there have been anything different that you would have done? Well, here's the thing. When I when I was I that was that was um I helped contribute. I mean, it, it was here's the thing. It was a great success. I'll take all the credit. If it was a failure, it wasn't my fault. But that's how things go. So, but you know, I worked with other people on that storyline. But but here's something that I thought Vince said to me made made. It made great sense at one time, if you think about it. At the time, Kane was the most hated heel we had. Think about what he was doing to Lita. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was hated. I mean, he had so much heat against him, right? And Vince said to me, he goes, the moment you have that much heat and you're hated, you can become a baby face very quickly. And I'm like, really? And so, and if you think about what we did, we, we made Kane this monstrous um, fiend wanted to have um, his offspring through Lita. He wanted to have a baby. You know, he wanted to carry on his bloodline. So we we created this monster. By bringing Snitsky in and by having the storyline, you know, you know, happen, the, the miscarriage, came from being this monster to a grieving father. So you have all this built-in emotion as a fan. You hate this guy. You hate this guy because he's a monster. All of a sudden, boom, you, you turn him around completely and you empathize with him. So that emotion, you have a fan, is still there, but now it's torn, you know, towards, oh, I feel bad for Kane, I hate Snitsky. And in Snitsky's line, I, you know, it wasn't my fault, which me and him, we still joke about that quite a bit, we still, we're, we're friends. <laughs> now he becomes the bigger heel. So it's, it's, it's storylines like that, it's a, it's a manipulation of emotion. Once you get the, the fans in, and you can manipulate their emotions, you can have to hate someone, it's not, a, it's not a far cry from love and hate. Because how many times... How many times does a, does a face turn to become a heel? It's the same thing. So, one, and so once Vince laid it out, and it was pretty smart, once we came so hated, we turned him. Because we brought someone worse in. Uh, and I thought, now, if, would I change the storyline differently? You know, I, I, think, I think I'd change a few things. I, I think if you think about the overall dynamic, it was kind of a brutal storyline, and mm-hmm. it's more set for a, a grindhouse exploitative movie than a wrestling ring, but... You know, I, I would have to see if I would, I'd be a different writer today, too. I would maybe look at the whole overall arc differently. You know, if you have three, if you have three characters involved in the storyline, what? how is it going to end for each character? What's their growth and where they're going to go after that? So I think I would have plotted it out that way. If I have Kane and Lita and I know Stitch is coming in, what would have happened to each character and how would they have gone off from there? So I think I would have looked at it as a bigger picture, you know, differently. So staying on the uh, on the subject of Kane, um, so you said you're do you, like, do you do you watch uh, Raw on a regular basis? Well, I have to admit that lately I haven't had the chance so crazy and stuff. I still keep in contact with Kane and some of the guys, um, but I haven't been as diligent as I should. But I sort of I sort of keep up with things going on. I saw that he you know he, um, he got injured not too long ago, and. Um, in one of the segments, but uh, it's just, it's like you said, we come in spurts. Like, I, I've been out, I I've, I've, I've fallen out. This is my time of falling out of the business. I've been so busy, busy writing wrestling, Alpha Dragon, I haven't watched it. That's the ironic thing. Hmm. The only reason why I'm asking is because I'm um, not sure if you you were familiar with another, another storyline that Kane was in at the beginning of 2012, the, the Embrace the Hate with John Cena. I don't know if you were familiar with that storyline. Yeah. How how would you have, how how did you like did you enjoy that storyline because that again that's another storyline that you know received a lot of you know negative negative feedback from fans and from people in the in the professional wrestling, wrestling business so well here's here's, the, here's one of the problems and it's it's kind of um it goes two ways I mean the WWE as a corporation as a company they're always talking about the anti bullying campaign mm-hmm. you know like you stay stay no to bullies and stuff and so as a, as a, as a publicly traded company they're putting a certain face to things and yet when they do a, a storyline it's a 
fucking embrace the hate, do this, and you sort of, you know, you're getting mixed messages sometimes. That's right. And I think, you know, once once you go from commercial break and you do your promo commercial, like, you know, stay in August bullying, and once you get into the ring, it's a different thing and stuff. And you know, even though something like, you know, just say, just say hate, it's just not embrace the hate. This is, um, it's wrestling. You, you need you need to have a villain. Your villain, your heel, your, your antagonist, your Rudo, he's going to be a guy that, you know, that is despicable. And so, it, it, even though it's hypocritical of giving a mixed message, it makes sense. It makes sense to go against the norms because, you know, if he didn't go against the norms of society, he wouldn't really be a, a heel, would he? No, that's, uh... You know, so I, 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 think, um, I think wrestling has a natural inclination to go against social norms because that's the way it is. I mean, you got to remember, these two, like, you know, you know, some of the uh, wrestlers in, in Mexico, there used to be a wrestler called El Nazi. I mean, that was his name, El Nazi. Mm-hmm. And, and his finishing move was, his finishing move was the SWAT sticker. I mean, how politically incorrect is that? <laughs> I mean, in Mexico, they get guys called Charlie Manson. I mean, so there's no political correctness. There's, there's, there's nothing, you know, if you're in wrestling, you're going to push the envelope. And if you, if you push too far, well, you'll know. The fans will let you know. Uh, case in point, like a Kitty Vincent scenario. <laughs> you know, it comes back to bite you in the ass. Yeah. You know? so, but if you, literally, but if you, don't, if you don't push the envelope, why are you there? You know, and, it, and, and the thing about that is you can always negate that once you have, like, embraced the hate and something like that. If your storylines are smart, if, you're, if you've got a good team behind it, at the end, your protagonist or your baby face is going to overcome that as they do. That's it. No matter how much you embrace the hate, at the end of the day, boom, you could get yourself over that. So you actually need the harder obstacle to overcome. The harder the obstacle for the, the baby face, the bigger his, his victory is. No, that's, uh, that's very true. I mean, uh, as, you know, as it was, you know, it was a very popular storyline for several months. And, uh, you know, it, it you know, can't, uh, you know, staying on the subject of Kane, he's a guy that see. It seems like that, you know, he, you know, he's he was involved in some fantastic storylines, and he was involved in some that weren't so fantastic. But he seems like a guy that just rolls with the punches and just wants to go out and just entertain. Well, I I, I can tell you, I know Kane the wrestler, I know Kane the man, and I enjoy both of them. And let me tell you about Kane the man, one of the smartest, literate well thought out, politically minded people you're ever going to meet. I mean, he really is, you probably know it's from his background, he's just, he's just a sharp, sharp guy, and just a you know, pleasure to be around. And the flip side, Kane the Wrestler is a guy I want to be in a dark room with. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, um, that's, 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 the, uh, that's the irony about it, stuff about the, about the business. But I think with Kane's storylines is, because who he is, he, he always has to end up to be a uh, heel. Just that, even though he may have these, you know, these flourishes of, you know, FaceTime, William Regal said to me the best. I think William Regal said to me the best thing. He summed it up best. When we were doing the Eugene angle, and we were doing some great stuff at Regal and Eugene, they, they had a great chemistry, and it was working. And Regal said to me, he goes, you know what, Dan? I have to turn on him. You know, I have to. That's because who I am. I'm a heel. No matter who I am, I'm a heel. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I said, you're right. And it actually, it was kind of a bittersweet moment, because even though we're doing the storyline, Regal himself felt kind of bittersweet. He goes, I have to turn on him. That's what I do. That's what I am. And Kane is, will always be, you know, he's, that's the, his persona as being the Kane, being the bad guy, will always overshadow everything else. Sometimes your persona is so strong that it's got to be that. But Kane, Kane's background, I mean, if you look at Kane's history, think about it. He said J.R. on fire. He should be in prison. I mean, <laughs> he put electro, you know, to shave it better. I mean, he put a guy into a fledgling dumpster. I mean, in, in the real world, this guy would be, you know, <laughs> in the state asylum. But that's why I said wrestling fans have short attention spans but long memories. And, and they, they can forgive they can forgive for the now, but they'll hold the grudge forever. That, <laughs> that makes sense. No, that, that definitely makes sense. And um, I think the same can be said about a guy like, uh, you know, Randy Orton. That, like, you know, Randy Orton, you know, he's, he has his, he has his you know, short, short spans of being a face. But Randy, Randy Orton, I think, is another guy that... You just look at him, and he just he personifies the heel character. Yeah. Listen, it, it, it comes down to this: whether you're a heel or face, the persona that you are, you, that has to be part of you. You know, you that that that's that's got to be your more your true inkling. I mean, some guys are better after playing the heel. It's just it's more natural. It's 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 a natural. 
natural thing. I mean, look at look at Bobby Heenan. Bobby Heenan to me is the greatest thing in wrestling ever. Bobby Heenan was the greatest manager, the greatest talker. Bobby got me to wrestling. Bobby's strength was being a heel, mm-hmm. and he knew it. And he played into it. And once you embrace that, once you embrace that, listen. Without if you the same with movie storytelling, movies. Without the villain, without the hero, without the bad guy, there's no hero. There's nothing. Without the, the bad guy, the bad guy gets everything going. You know, the bad guy, he's active, and most of the part, the hero is very passive. He only reacts after the bad guy's done something. So it's the bad guy that gets the, the show on the road. I mean, cute, and, and guys like guys like Heenan, guys like Owen, that's, you know, that's they, their strong suit. You play your strong suit, which is being the bad guy. You have more fun being the bad guy. When people hate you, then then you're really there. When people hate you, then, it's, then, then you've done your job. And it seems like it, see, it seems like uh, in professional wrestling, the heel is the easier character to play. Um, yeah, because what you've got to do is you've got to go against the norms. You've got to go against what people like, and sometimes we all want to do that. We all want to be the bad guy. We, everyone wants to be the bad guy. Everyone wants to be Darth Vader once in a while. Everyone wants to be the villain. Because, you know what, they're the guys doing the fun things. They're the guys, if you think about it, they're the guys who are told, don't do this, don't do that, but you know what, they make their own rules. The, the way the villain is set up is he goes by his own rules. The hero, especially Lucha Libre, the technical, which is the hero, the heel, he's the technical, he goes by the rules. He goes by the technical ways of doing things. The Rudo is the bad guy. He, he makes his own rules. So the, the villain, the Rudo, the heel, he's his own man. And, that, and everyone, in a way, wants to be their own man. They want to be the guy that calls the shots. Tony Montana, I mean, you know, look at, look at you, know, you know, Tony Soprano. They're yeah. the guys, that, they're, the, they're the anti-social guys that make their own rules, and everyone wants to be like that to some extent. That's why these shows are so popular. Breaking Bad, Boardwalk Empire, The Sopranos. Why are these shows, the anti-social characters, are popular? Because everyone wants to relate to the guy that makes the calls his own shots. It's the same thing in wrestling. It's, it's all story. It's all based on storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, you were... <laughs> You're definitely right about that, that, you know, everybody wants to be, you know, even if it's just for five minutes and, uh, you know, and, you know, they, they want to be the bad guy. And, yeah, the it's it's no different in uh, in uh, pro wrestling. So you had mentioned in the uh, beginning of the show that you wrote the screenplay for uh, the WWE film See No Evil. Now, you know, what, evil, yeah, yeah what, what was that like? Like, was that was that like a an, a, an extensive process for you? Did it come naturally or? Like, are you a big, you know, are you a big, you know, uh, fan of the horror genre? Oh, I'm a huge, yeah, I'm a big horror, huge horror fan. I mean, that's a, a major, I mean, I used to write horror movies, so what I do, um, you know, I work with my friend Tim Sullivan, he's a director, a producer, I've worked with him on a few things, I've gone to Spain to write some movies, but I think the horror film, it's, it's the one, it's the one genre where everyone seems to like, because um, everyone wants to be scared, mm-hmm. and... I, the thing with, about Sino Evil is I had a story in my mind for a long time, and my manager at the time was uh, Mason Novak, who, you know, went on to be down for Academy Award and stuff, and he called me up, he said, the WWE wants you to come down and pitch an idea to them. And I said, what, like in a couple of weeks or something, you know, give me some ideas, you know, give me a couple of days to get some ideas together. He goes, no, they want you to come tomorrow. And she, I go, what? So yeah, he goes, you're good under pressure, you'll come up with something. So I went down to the, the offices, and I decided to write it. And it was a nuclear casino evil. They loved the idea. But now, for them loving it and me writing the screenplay, that was two different worlds. Because once I wrote my screenplay, it went through the typical Hollywood BS of like people coming in, changing things, notes coming in, and it became, that became a really torturous process of seeing, you know, my original idea, the finished product, the two different things. Two different things. But listen, the movie was made. You know, it was a, it was a fun, and Kane enjoyed it. Uh, I had people like, like you know, I had Toby Hooper, the director, the picture chance on mask, but he wanted to do it. I had Lance Henriksen, the actor, who wanted to be in it, and you know, wow. things didn't work out that way. But you know, the movie was made, and I was I was I was happy. I think Kane did a great job. Gregory Dark did a great job directing it, and it's it's a horror film for the fans. I mean, that's that's all I can say, really. And to this uh, to this day, it's it's the most uh, successful. Um, uh, WWE film that that the company has released. So I mean that you know that's that that in really? itself. From what from from what I've uh, you know from what I've heard and from what um, you know a lot of people uh, seem to enjoy the movie. So 
Yeah, it's a, it, it, it's, it's it's a fun film. It's just it's just it's just a little you know roller coaster ride. That's all it's going to be. I mean, it can't be more than that. You, you know, sometimes you're just going to make it what it is, and that's what I went in like just having fun, having fun. Absolutely. Now, st- like staying on the, on the, the topic of horror films, do you think that um, because there are some horror films that kind of, I think, in my opinion, I'm, I'm a big you know fan of the horror genre too, but I see some of these movies that you know I haven't seen yet, like The Human Centipede, and some of these movies that are just have, I think, ridiculous amounts of gore and violence. Do you think that's necessary to write a good, you know, to create a good horror movie? Yeah, for sure. I think another example of a of a of a horror franchise that kind of took away from the 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 basic plot was, I think, Saw. When Saw first came out in two thousand five, it was a you know I thought it was a tremendous movie and it was a fantastic concept. But then as you know, Saw two and three and four and five, six and seven, the gore factor kind of increased, and then you know the storyline was kind of mixed in with the gore, and that was basically it.
That's right. Yeah, no, that's no. You're. I think you're. Uh, you know, you're one hundred percent right about that. Um, so getting back to um, see no evil. Uh, if WWE approached approached you today in two thousand thirteen to do a sequel, uh, would you do it? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's business, and I already have a sequel written, which is funny. But yeah, I mean, business, business, is business. That's the bottom line. You know, it's just the bottom line, and and I would like to do a sequel to that. I have one written. I, I continue on of the story we have of the survivors and of Ken character. You know, of his uh, of Jacob Goodnight. I think that's uh, I think it's a really good idea. But you know, once again, they've got to, you know they own the rights to it. But in a, in a heartbeat, of course, I'd in a heartbeat because I'd like to see um, the story continue. Excellent. You had mentioned um, you had mentioned earlier that you kind of washed your hands of, of pro wrestling for a while. If, if if Vince called you on the phone today and said, you know, we'd like you to come back, would you go back to the WWE or even maybe maybe TNA? Uh, well, I, I've been a you know, approached by certain things, and they'd have to be, you know, but you can never say never. You know what I mean? You can never say never. I would like, you know, uh, if things would have to change in some aspect, but yeah, I would like to go back, and part of me would, part of me would, if that makes sense, you know, I couldn't go back to what it was before, I have to go back, a little thing changed differently, but, you know, uh, part of you still always loves the business, that's the thing you can't escape, you can't escape from it. That's right, yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's very true. So, so before we go, uh, Dan, I just want to let the listeners know that we have some uh, fantastic prizes to give away uh, in, in reference to the uh, Ultimo Dragon uh, Kickstarter campaign. So the first listener that donates $30 or more to Ultimo Dragon's Kickstarter campaign, as I said earlier in the show, just go to kickstarter.com and type up Ultimo Dragon, uh, Ultimo Dragon uh, graphic novel. And the first person that listens to, this, uh, listens to the show that donates $30 or more will receive a free autographed Ultimo Dragon action figure in his uh, orange wrestling gear. Now, if you go to the Ultimo Dragon Kickstarter page, you'll see uh, an excellent, high-quality, blown-up picture of the action figure. And But now here's the, the catch. if you, you have to mention that you listen to this episode of Kayfabe Kickout Audio with my guest Dan Madigan in the comments section, and you'll receive the action figure 100% free. So, like I said, $30 or more. And I also have we also have two free... Ultimo Dragon autographed headshot photos to give away for anyone who comments on this episode on the website, kfabekickout.com. And uh, just mention uh, just mention, uh, just mention your comment on Twitter at, the, at, uh, at kfabe underscore kickout, and I will pick two uh, random winners for those two free uh, Ultimo Dragon autographed headshot photos. So these are these are fantastic prizes. And like Dan said at the, at the beginning of the show, there are so many different... Uh, Donation options, you can donate five, ten, three, six dollars You can donate, donate up to $10,000 if you have it. So, um, so yeah, Dan... That'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dan, I just want to um, uh, thank you uh, for being on the show today. And so this is the part where you just plug away uh, whatever you would like. How can people get in touch with you, uh, etc.? Oh, great. Look, I've had a great time. I can't thank you enough, but if you want to get hold of me, I think the best way is through the um, Kickstarter project, the Ultimo Dragon Graphic Novel. Go to Kickstarter. You're writing Ultimo, Dra- Ultimo Dragon Graphic Novel. And um, you're going to see everything we have there. And you're going to see, you know, we have uh, two great videos. One is the video of us explaining what we want to do. The other one is just an amazing trailer for the graphic novel, which is an amazing piece put together. The music, the animation is incredible. And we have our video explaining what we're going to do. So I think any questions, just go there and check it out. And then uh, you can just contact me through there. But I really want to appreciate, I really appreciate the time you've given me. I can see that, you know, you're passionate about the business as I am. And I think we're trying to reach the fans as well who are as passionate. So it's, like I said, it's us trying to give, up, give it our best shot. And I appreciate what you've done, the fans have done, what they will do. And, and please contact us, donate, contribute anything you can. And um, we look forward to talking to you again. Because I have your information. I'll be talking to you uh, later on today. Excellent. Yeah, no, you're you're more than welcome, Dan. And as I said, uh, you know, this is a fantastic project. And for like I said, wrestling fans, if you haven't checked out Dan's book on the the rich history of lucha libre, a mondo lucha a gogo, uh, you can check that out. The book is available everywhere. It's available online, Amazon, um, anywhere that books are sold. You can check out this book uh, from front to back. Just a fantastic history about lucha libre. Uh, it has a foreword by uh, you know former multiple time 
WWE champion Kurt Angle. Just a fantastic book. Lots of high quality photos and just a like I said, just a fantastic walkthrough. If you're not familiar with Lucha Libre, if you're a fan of Lucha Libre, definitely pick this book up. So, so Dan, thank you very much for being on the show, and uh, we'd love to have you back again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, all your listeners. I appreciate it. I'll keep you posted what's going on, okay? Sounds great. Great. Thanks. I'll talk to you soon. Yep, you bet. Thanks a lot, Dan. And as always, wrestling fans, you can check out the official website of Kayfabe Kickout. That's kayfabekickout.com is the URL. We have the latest wrestling news, a ton of fantastic interviews with some of the biggest stars in pro wrestling, Jake the Snake Roberts, Christopher Daniels, uh, Julie Hart, the legendary Les Thatcher, and so many more. Uh, We have 100% free audio episodes of Kayfabe Kickout that you can listen to anywhere you go. Um, So that's the official website of Kayfabe Kickout, kayfabekickout.com. You can check out the official Twitter account as well. Twitter.com slash kayfabe underscore kickout is the URL for that. Check out the official Facebook page, facebook.com slash kayfabe kickout. You can check us out on Google+. Plus. Just go to the Google search bar and type up kayfabe kickout Google+. Plus. Uh, you can check out the official merchandise store of kayfabe kickout at zazzle.com slash kayfabe underscore kickout. Uh, you can check out our all of our audio episodes of kayfabe kickout on Podomatic, if you're a big fan of Podomatic, that's podomatic.kfabekickout.com is the URL for that. So I will be back with a brand new uh, audio ep- audio episode very soon. Again, I'd like to thank my uh, very special guest, former WWE writer and creative team member, uh, Dan Madigan, for being on the show. As I said, I will be back. So have a great day, wrestling fans. <laughs>